Hey, good evening, New Vision. It's good to be with you tonight. For those of you that I haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Brad White. I serve as one of our pastors on staff, and it's always a privilege to gather in God's house to worship his name. You know, we've been navigating a very interesting season, but one thing that has remained true during this season is the faithfulness of God and that God is still good. Amen? And so tonight we are here to worship a God that's worthy of our praise. You know, as a church, we want to make it as easy as possible for you to get in contact with us. And one of the ways that we've set up for you to do that, you can actually pull out your cell phone right now, is you can text to 615-257-8377 and send the word next. And that's going to let us know that you have a decision that you're interested in making, maybe that you have some prayer needs, and a staff person will follow up with you. Let's stand together as we get to worship this God who is so worthy of our praise. Lift our voices, and sing with us. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. Oh, and every chain will break, broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is Lion, the Lion of Judah, He's roaring.
easy to forget in, in facing trials and tribulations that we have that victory, that God is enough, that we have salvation, I hope for tomorrow. Let's sing this over the Bible. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. That's good. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Sing that confidently. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. takes what feels hopeless and gives hope who he is. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn
There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be in this reckoning I know I will never be given us victory, a God who comes and walked in our shoes, knowing no sin, living a perfect life for you and I, yet dying on a cross for us, standing in our place. And when we face adversity, we face those moments of doubt, our God already has the truth. There is nothing that separates us from through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. You guys can have a seat.
Well, church, thank you so much for continuing to give us grace through this partnership that we have with you through this re-entry process that's been so interesting. And thank you for taking the extra step of registering for the services and registering your kids. We greatly appreciate it. This coming Wednesday night is gonna be a great night, a great opportunity for families to come together, a great opportunity for you to think about who are the people that are close to you but far from God that you can strategically invite to our Fall Fest. Fall Fest will happen here on the church's property in the new parking lot at 5 p.m. until 7 p.m. We're gonna have food trucks. We're gonna have trunks and treats for kids. It's gonna be a great night, and we would love for your kids to dress up as well. We're even gonna have a costume contest. We'd ask that the costumes not be too scary, but it's just gonna be a fun time, a great opportunity just to have a great time of celebration as a church family. So we want you to be excited about this. We want you to be looking forward to this, and maybe you're interested in doing a trunk of your own. We have an opportunity for you to do that. You can text trunk to the number on the screen, and we'll get you all the details that you need so that you can decorate your vehicle for that night. We're also still taking candy donations. You can bring those here to the church in the atrium or in the hub area up until October the 25th. So we're looking forward to that night and hope that you will join us. Man, I am more than excited that we are going to have an opportunity to gather together for our first man church since COVID together here in the worship center on November the 1st. This event will stream online as well, but we're partnering with First Baptist Castle Street and Pastor James McCarroll. Pastor James is going to come and he's going to speak to us. We'll have a night of worship beginning at six o'clock and we should conclude sometime around seven. If you can't make it in person, we'd love for you to watch online because I believe that God is going to show up and God is going to do something incredible when we bring our two churches together under this banner of Christ. What I'd love for you to do right now is take out your phones. I'm talking to you, all of you. Take out your phones right now. I'd love for you to do this. We keep talking about this opportunity for you to text the word next to the number on the screen. Well, we have done something to step up our game a little bit. We've got this number and we realized this week that it actually spells out steps. Isn't that crazy how God works? So you, we'd love for you to put this number in your phone, 615-25-STEPS. 615-257-8377. Now, what you're gonna be able to do starting tomorrow morning at six o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night, every single day of the week for the foreseeable future, you're gonna be able to call this number if you have questions about taking a next step, if you have questions about salvation, if you have questions about baptism, maybe you're in a moment where you just need some prayer or you need some encouragement, you're gonna be able to call this number and a staff person will answer the phone. This is how much we care about you. This is how much we want to walk out this Christian journey with you. We want to be in your corner. So put this number in your phone, and when you feel like you just need someone to encourage you, you need someone to pray with you, or you have a question, please call us and let us be a resource for you. We are so grateful for the continued partnership that you have brought with your giving. What an opportunity that we have to be faithful stewards of what God has given us, that we can leverage our earthly resources for eternal transformation. And we had a great opportunity to go into Spring Valley neighborhood this past week and to do a Rock the Block event and God showed up. There's some pictures on the screen that you can see. This is what I want to give my earthly resources towards, things that will impact eternity, things that will far outlive me. And so tonight I wanna remind you that you have an opportunity that you can give online. You can also give in the black boxes on your way out of service tonight. Let me pray for us as we continue to worship together. Father, you are good. We are grateful for an opportunity that we have to gather. God, we know that you have remained faithful through a season that has seemed so uncertain. God, we know one thing for certain, that you are on the throne and that you are sovereign and that you are good. God, thank you for allowing us to partner with you in this work of ministry, in this work of sharing the gospel and spreading it throughout our community, throughout our city, and throughout our world. God, now would you stir our hearts and our minds as we study your word. God, and would we leave change because of interacting with it. In your name we pray, amen. Let's continue to worship together through baptism. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Katie Walter to you. Uh, There's going to be some music playing in the background. It's a Chris Tomlin song entitled Home. 
And it became very special to Katie over the last several weeks. It was a song that helped sustain her as her grandfather was dying. It, actually, they were playing the song uh, for his uh, last moments here on earth. And, and her grandfather passing away caused Katie to ask some questions about, well, what would happen if and when I die? And so we had a nice gospel conversation and today she's here to proclaim that Jesus Christ is her Lord and Savior, and she knows without a shadow of a doubt that if she were to die today, that she would spend forever with Jesus in heaven. So, Katie, I am just so proud of you, and I'm going to give you a chance just to profess your faith by repeating after me, I believe Jesus is the Son of God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. my Savior and my Lord. Very good. Katie, upon your profession of faith, it's my great joy to baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. From darkness to light, this is the story we all share as the people of God. He draws us out to draw us in. From the birth of Israel to the church today, God delivers and dwells with his people. Week 12, The Burden. Well, it is great to see you guys. Uh, for me, way more than you, it is good to be out. I've been in quarantine for two weeks. Amy's uh, tested positive, and she's doing better, so we're thankful for that. Thank you for praying uh, for her. I was going to try to lose some weight over the quarantine, but all the ladies in her group are bringing food and all kinds of stuff, so I picked up a few pounds, but I'm, uh, I'm glad to be back uh, out. She's, uh, she, as I said, she's feeling uh, really good. She just uh, lacks energy a little bit right now, so of course she's married to a great husband who's picking up the pace around the house like you would not believe. It's, it's unreal. It's unreal, really, what I'm doing. Anyhow, no, we're glad you're here tonight. Uh, have you enjoyed the Exodus series? I, I, I really have enjoyed studying this this book, and Nobody really respond, responded, which was awkward. I've, I've enjoyed this. So the podcast, we, we've said if you stay with us through 17 weeks of sermons that we're doing through the book of Exodus and all the podcasts that are there every single week, five days a week, and, and the reading plan, and you do an Exodus small group, listen, you, you ought to have the equivalent of a master's degree in the book of Exodus. So... And so here's what we're going to do. I'm excited about this. We're not even going to tell the folks this weekend. Just for our Thursday night folks, we're going to, we're going to have a final exam as we close out in a few weeks of the book of Exodus. You, if, for, if you want to take it, it's, you don't have to take it. It's not going to lose your salvation or anything. Just for you who've, I mean, you've, you've, you've done the podcast, you've studied, you, you, you dug in. And so we, we want to see who in this church knows the most about Exodus. I took the test today. I didn't do so well on it. Be honest, you could probably do better than me. It's, it's. Uh, I, I had my wife is taking it probably right now. She'll, she'll beat me, but it, it's going to be fun. So uh, we're looking forward to that. And then we're going to jump in after the first of the year to Hebrews. I've told you before. Once you understand Exodus, the book of Hebrews just kind of jumps off the pages because all of these things that we studied in Exodus, Hebrews was written to this Jewish audience. You're going to understand them in a whole different way, and it's going to be really cool. And so we got podcast, all kinds of different stuff going out for Hebrews as well too. So we're excited about that. Now tonight. If you have your Bible, you can look at uh, Exodus chapter 17. Uh, this is a powerful, powerful story. And tonight, uh, we're going to look at this story. The children of Israel have uh, passed through uh, the Red Sea, if you've been with us. And so the army of uh, Egypt, the most powerful army in the world, has been destroyed. God's given them this great victory. Uh, all they had to do is stand still, and God fought for them. Now on their way to the promised land, uh, we saw last week, as Nick did a great job, they begin to complain uh, because because of the, their desert wandering, and God provided manna for them, but then they got tired of manna, so God provided quail. They got thirsty, and God provided water uh, from, from a rock. And so uh, today as we pick up in, in Exodus chapter 17, we're going to see uh, something I think is a story that's really going to help us, and we're going to look at this through the lens of leadership, because I think all of us can up our leadership game. 
right? Everybody who's a follower of Christ, you're a leader, right? We should be influencing somebody. So if you're listening to this tonight and say, you know what, that, I, I'm not a leader. Yeah, well, yes, you are. I want to be a better leader in my home. I want to be a better leader for my, for my family. I want to be a, be a better leader maybe in your workplace. I, I certainly want to be a better leader for our church. But all of us, I, I think you could all agree that uh, really there's a leadership vacuum in our, in our culture today. And so it, we live in a culture where everybody is, is, is prone to be super critical. People are great at criticism in the culture we live in today, right? I mean, everybody's a great critic, but there are fewer great leaders. And so I think today we're going to see some great lessons on on leadership. So let's look at Exodus chapter 17. I forgot to say hi to those of you who are walk, uh, watching online. I'm just out of quarantine, so I'm like super fired up and, and ready to go. And so Exodus chapter 17, uh, starting in verse 8. Here we go. Let's take a look at this. We'll read a couple verses. I want to make some points, and then we'll read some more. In verse 8, it says, the Amalekites. Now, we might want to stop there. Some of you are like, Okay, if you're going to stop after the second word every single time, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll never get, get, get out of here tonight. Who were the Amalekites? Now, this is interesting the, to me. Uh, the Amalekites were descendants of uh, uh, Esau. You remember Isaac had two boys. If you go back to the book of Genesis, Jacob and Esau, and they were constantly battling for this birthright. And so the Amalekites are the descendants of Esau. And so uh, these are, are folks who still, after over a thousand years, still had a, had a problem because they felt like they missed out on what was rightfully theirs. And so the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. And so in, in, you might want to write this reference down in your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 25. You can write Deuteronomy chapter 25 down here. Uh, because Deuteronomy chapter 25, you want to go and read it, it'll tell you a little bit more about this attack. The Amalekites, they were a band, that, they were just a group of, of sort of desert wanderers, and so uh, they attacked the children of Israel, but they attacked them from the rear. And so as the children of Israel were, were uh, making their way uh, to the promised land, uh, the, the children, uh, the elderly, the pregnant, the sick, they would have been at the back of the party. The weakest would have been at the back of the party. And this just shows you how vile and how evil the Amalekites were because they came and attacked the weakest of the children of Israel. Now, again, the children of Israel had been slaves. They had been slaves for 430 years. They had never had to fight, and now there's going to be a fight on their hands. And so we're going we're gonna to see that. So Moses, verse 9, Moses said to Joshua, this is very interesting. This is the first time that Joshua is mentioned in the book of Exodus. Spoiler alert, uh, he's going be, uh, to be a great hero in the book of Exodus. He's actually going to be the one who leads the children of Israel into the promised land. But this is the first that we hear of, of Joshua, right? And he's, he's going to be a crucial character uh, to the rest of the story. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites uh, tomorrow. Or he says, go out and fight the Amalekites. Uh, period means to stop. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Now let's think about this from if you're Joshua, right? What, what, what Moses said. I mean, the Amalekites, here, here they, they, they come, and they've attacked the children of Israel in a very ruthless, ruthless way. And Moses said, hey, Joshua, and, and by the way, Joshua, Joshua is, this name in Hebrew is the same name that Jesus had in Greek, Yeshua. It means God saves. And so Moses says, hey, God saves. It's time for you to put your name to, into practice. I want you to go out and fight. And Joshua's like, well, where are you going to be? I'm going to be up on the hill. I'm going to be praying. And maybe Joshua would have said, like, why don't you go fight and I'll go up on the hill? Maybe. It's not in the Bible, but I wonder if, if that, that's what's going on here. Now, Moses is, Moses is an 80-year-old dude at this time. Now, Moses was, Moses was a fighter. In fact, he killed an Egyptian. I mean, that's where we saw this as a 40-year-old man, and he has to, has to flee. But we're going to see something super important about what Moses is doing. So he goes up on a hill uh, with the staff of God. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses... Aaron and her went to the top of the hill. All right, so ju just really quickly, uh, who was Aaron? If, you're, if you remember, Aaron was, was Moses' brother, right? Most people believe, most people believe her uh, was Moses' brother-in-law. Her, uh, many Bible scholars believe her uh, married Miriam, uh, Moses' sister. And so just so you know some context here, Moses would have been 80 years old. Aaron was older than Moses. So let's say, let's say Aaron could have been 84 years old. Um, her uh, could have been as clo close to 90 years old. So these are, these are three vintage dudes here, right? And they're going up on the top of, of the hill. So let's stop, and I think we see our first leadership lesson. If you want to up your leadership game, and can we, can we just agree we all want to up our leadership game at some level, right? Whether you're a student, 
uh, whether in the workplace, whether in your home. I mean, we all want to up our leadership game. And there's some great principles here, some great principles that will help you do that. Well, here's the first principle we see in these first couple of verses. Great leaders have a proper vantage point. Like if you want to be a great leader, you have to have a, cro- a proper vantage point. And that's what, uh, that's what Moses does. I think we have just a picture of an overlook. We'll put on this back uh, uh, video wall here just to, in, in a second. This is what Moses does. There's, there's, a, there's a fight that's about to break out. And Moses says instead of him being down in the valley in the middle of the fight, he said, I'm going to take Aaron and I'm going to take her and we're going to get up on the hill. All right? So why is he going up on, on, on the hill? It's a very important thing. Because Moses needs to see what's going on. He needs to have proper perspective. He wants to, we'll get into this a little bit more. He wants the children of Israel to see him. He also wants them to see the, the, the staff that he's going to have in his hand. That's really important because that's going to be a great remand, reminder of the judgment of God. Because if you've studied with us through the book of Exodus, the staff is pretty instrumental in some amazing things. The Nile turns to blood. It was the staff uh, that, that Moses used to do that. Obviously, God is working through that. But the staff is just a reminder of God's power and of God's judgment. It was was the staff that really uh, God used just to close the Red Sea back up and destroy the Egyptian uh, army. So we're going to see how that's really important. But, but here's the thing. Your vantage point, your vantage point allows you to see clearly and for God to be seen clearly in your life. And so I think if you and I are going to be great leaders, we need a proper vantage point in our life. So what what does that really mean? Well, a proper vantage point, first of all, means this. It means that we need to get a proper perspective, God's perspective on life. And let let me just say it this way. If you stay in the valley, you know, just surrounded by by folks in this culture, you may never get the proper perspective on life. You need need to understand that, that you and I are here. This life is about us living in a way that would bring the Lord glory, not just about our satisfaction. Most people don't know that because they don't have the proper vantage point, but you need God's vantage point. Does that, does that, does that make sense? So you need God's perspective on life, on, on your marriage, right? Because as we think about marriage, man, so many folks, I, I get a chance to meet with uh, a lot of couples uh, and have met with a lot of couples through the years, and when you sit down and begin to talk about their, their marriage and where things have fallen apart, really one of the reasons why it's fallen apart is they have an improper vantage point. They just thought they were going to meet someone, and that person was going to just satisfy them and bring about happiness, and they're not happy, so they think they've met the wrong person. What's happened? They have the wrong vantage point on marriage. Really, they don't understand that marriage, first of all, is gospel reenactment, that I'm loving Amy in the way that Jesus has loved me, right? You see that? And so if you don't have the proper vantage point, you cannot lead on work, right? Proper vantage point on work. The Bible says we work as unto the Lord. Are you you seeing this? We need to have the proper vantage point, God's vantage point on all these things. And just being here tonight and being in the Word, it gives us a chance to get the proper vantage point. Um, Parenting. Let, Let me just press into two things here to try to illustrate this. Um, if I had a chance to do it over again as a dad, I guess I'm getting that as a grandparent, right? But I, I would do it differently. I, I, I would spend more time observing, studying, listening uh, to my boys, understanding. You see, I was so concerned with their behavior. Does that, it's not that that's a bad thing, but I was so concerned with their behavior. And you know why I was so concerned with their behavior? Because I was so concerned with how people uh, felt about me. So really, my concern about their behavior was just really super selfish, if that makes sense. Like, I want you guys to behave tonight so people will think better about me. Is that too honest for you? Right? I know nobody else has wrestled with that. But I, would, I, I didn't have the right vantage point even on parenting, you know? And so I would listen more and understand their bent, and know their bent meaning knowing how God had created them and how God had wired them, and just have a different vantage point as a parent, right? A different vantage point uh, in my marriage, all those things. I, I, I tell young guys sometimes when they'll listen to me, study your wife. Man, be able to go to a restaurant and order for her. I'm still working on that, and sometimes I get it right, and sometimes I, I don't, and, you know, and Amy's like, you know, we've been married for a long time. You still don't know, and, and but you see, I, I'm trying to, having that problem proper vantage point on life. It's such an important thing. I think as a leader, right, as a leader here, for me, 
Like, I, I have to spend more time kind of walking around and seeing what's going on. I want to know what's going on. I can't be involved in everything, but I want to I want to, I want to kind of see what's happening. I, I can't be involved in everything. I have, to, I have to pull back and see what's going on. So if you want to be a great leader, you have to have a, a, you have to have a proper vantage point because you have to see what's going on. Now, secondly, that's not the only thing about vantage point. The second thing is, is this. Uh, you, you have got to be seen. That's what Moses is doing. Moses said, hey, hey, Joshua, go fight, right? I'm going to go up on the hill. Why is Moses going to go up on the, on the hill? So the children of Israel could see him and see what he was doing. He was praying for them, right? And so I, I think this, I think you have to leverage your platform, your influence. And, and I hear people say this all the time, and it's just false. I don't have a lot of time to flesh it out. People say, well, my faith is a private thing. Your faith is never meant to be a private thing. That's just not biblical, right? It's not. I, I know that is controversial, and I know people don't like that, and I know it makes a lot of sense in our culture that my faith is a private thing. Well, your faith is never meant to be a private thing. It's meant to, to show the greatness and the goodness of our God. And so we have to realize that, listen, we, we have a proper vantage point. We want people to see us. We want to influence people in the, in the right way. I, I, I say this as, as a parent, let your children catch you in the Word in the morning. That's one of the greatest things you can do as a parent. Let them see you happening to the right things. I still think back on this as a young boy, the things that marked me as a young boy, I can remember my, my, my dad uh, going forward in church services and kneeling and praying. I don't remember much about the sermons, right? But I, I remember that. I can remember him doing that. I, the things that were important to him in his faith, you see, he was leveraging his vantage point. And we've got to do that, right, in our, in our life. Uh, that, that's, what, that's what Paul said. He said, follow me as I follow Christ. And so that's this vantage point that we would just live in a way that others could see us. Because let me just tell you something. People that are in the battle, they're confused, they don't know what to do, and they lack hope. They need somebody that they can look to, and they can see how to live this thing out. Does that make sense? And so that's what Moses is doing when he was up there. He, he, he's saying, you know, guys, take a look at me. And he's, he's, also, he's also got the staff, right? And he's reminding them of the power of God. Don't we need to be reminded of that so very often? Like when he holds the staff up, what are they remembering? You know, the Nile River turned to blood. That's pretty powerful right? All the 10 plagues that came on, that's pretty powerful. How God destroyed the Egyptians. I mean, we're in a fight right now, and we're prone to think that, listen, we might be overcome, but then I see that stuff, it reminds me of the power and the presence of God. You see that? And so that's what having that vantage point where others can see you and see your example is, is super, super powerful. Now, let's look on down at the second thing, verse 11, Exodus chapter 17, verse 11. I love this. As long Now, here's Joshua. He's down fighting the Amalekites. This is a ruthless group of people, right? Cowardly people, right? When you come in uh, late in the day and you attack the pregnant women, the elderly men and women, and the children, I mean, that's evil, isn't it? Can we all agree? I haven't got anybody to nod at anything. I mean, we can, that's evil, right? I mean, and the Amalekites really kind of serve as a picture of the enemy who's pursuing us and always attacks our weakest point. Is that right? Does the enemy do that in your life? He does, and that's what you see here, fleshed out. Now, here's Moses up on the, he's on the vantage point, right? He's up there getting the proper perspective. As long as Moses held his hands, held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. So if I'm Joshua, I'm like, Moses, get your hands up, right? Keep your hands up, bro. I mean, don't let your hands, don't let them down. When Moses' hands grew tired, you ever thought about this? Here? I mean, just I mean, we, we won't do it tonight. But you ever just had to raise your hands above your head for a period of time, hold your hands up? I mean, after a while, just I mean, you, you, your shoulders start to ache, right? And so Moses, Moses is doing that. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone. Who's the they? Aaron and her. They took a stone and put him under it, and he sat on it. Aaron and her held his hands up. Man, that's a great picture. Uh, this is a guy who had some dudes that were around him who loved him and cared for him and knew what was going on. They held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Powerful. So Joshua overcame the Amalekites with the sword. Isn't this a great passage? That is a killer passage. We can talk about it all night. There's so much stuff here. Some of you are like, please don't. Well, I'm not, but it's exciting. Here's the second thing, just from a leadership principle. Do you want to up your leadership game? I do. If I'm going to be a great leader, I've got to have a proper vantage point, right? I've got to see. I've got to see what's going on. I've got to have, the, I've got to have God's perspective in the situation. But secondly, great leader, leaders realize that prayer is a matter of life and death. I think the church needs to hear what we're about to say. 
in this story, it makes sense. I mean, prayer is a matter of life and death. I hear so many people get so theological about prayer and evangelism. Let, let me just tell you something. Here's what, it's, it's not your job. This sounds really arrogant and harsh, and I just want to say it, right? Okay, I've been under quarantine. Cut me some slack. You know, I hear people say, well, you know what? Our God knows everything from the beginning to the end, and, and it's, it's, it's preordained. God's going to do what he's going to do, so I'm not sure that my prayer matters. I hear people say that all the time. Can I just tell you something just to be as, just, as, just as raw as I know how to be? It's not your job to concern yourself with how your prayers mesh with God's preordained, preordained plan. It's just your job to pray. <laughs> right? It's not your job to try to figure out how all that stuff, that is above your pay grade and above my pay grade. Do you agree with that? It's way above our pay grade, but it is quite clear that God has called you to pray, right? And I would say this, pray like history hangs in the balance because it does. In this story, right? In this story, does history hang in the balance? When Moses' hands go down, what happens? The Amalekites are winning. When his hands go up, the Israelites are winning. So in, in, in our life, pray like history hangs in the balance. What would happen in the church today if we begin to pray like history hung in the balance? It'd be unbelievable. And, and, and pray consistently. Just a couple things about prayer, just really quickly. Consistently. I mean, Moses, from early in the morning to late at night, he's praying. Earnestly. Prayer is work, right? True prayer is work. Like when Moses said, hey, I'm going to go up here on the hill. Joshua, you go down there and fight the Amalekites. I mean, Joshua's like, no, no, I'll go up on the hill. Really, because he thought what we're doing is the work. No, both of them were work. I mean, but what Moses is doing and Aaron and her are doing, that's work, right? I love this verse, Colossians chapter 4, verse 12. You, you, you can read all of Colossians 4 later on tonight. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says, devote yourself to prayer. That, that sounds like prayer is a pretty important thing in the life of a believer. Look, look at verse 12. I want to point out verse 12. Epaphras, this is, this is the Apostle Paul, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always, listen to what the Scripture says, he is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in the will of God and mature and fully assured. Prayer, prayer is a fight. And when Paul says about Epaphras, he said he is wrestling in prayer for you. Have any of you, let me ask you this question, any of you, any of you ever wrestled? Any of you high school wrestlers? Any guys in here high school wrestlers? Have you ever just, yeah, I mean, re, the, the wrestlers are the most, I think they're, uh, swimmers are wrestlers. One of those are the most in-shape athletes that there is. I mean, unbelievable. I, I, my boys, when they got, uh, you know, it, it happens. If you raise boys, they'll turn about, I don't know, 14, 15, and then they want to take you, right? I mean, they want to go at you. I mean, I, it's just fun. They would say, you know, I want to I take let's go. And I'm like, no, and my wife, this is true about my, you would not know this about my wife. Some of you say she's so sweet. Well, she's not, She's not. She's really not all that sweet. She would always say, yeah, take them. Go. And she's agging me on. Dad, go. I'm like, no, I don't want to. She said, yeah. Fight him. Wrestle him. You know, and so here we go. And if you wrestle with a 16-year-old boy or now a 20-something and a 21-year-old boy, like I can wrestle with them for 20 seconds, and I am gassed. Have you ever done that? I mean, you just go, I mean, and they go hard. And I've, I, 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 did, I started lifting weights a couple years ago again. Why? for those moments because my wife is right there and I don't want to be embarrassed in front of her. And so I say, okay, I got 30 seconds. Here we go. And I go, and I am so ex exhausted after 30 seconds. But listen, that's what true prayer is. True prayer, the kind of prayer that God begins to come in and move in power is when we're willing to wrestle, when we're willing to fight, when we're willing to stand on the hill and pray from sun up till sundown. That's what you see. Prayer also involves others. That's what Moses does. He invites Aaron and her up there with him. Prayer invites others. One of, one of the greatest things about, for me, about, for me personally about being a group is, um, is just the guys in, 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 in my group, and they're just constantly sending out prayer requests, and I'm just, it's stuff that's going on in my life. I just love that throughout, throughout the day. Uh, you know, we're, we're praying tonight for Landon, who's a college student in Knoxville, one of our guys' son, who's got, got COVID. But the other night, it was, uh, it was two nights ago, I'm sitting at home, and one of our guys says, uh, hey, fellas, I just want to tell you that, that uh, my, my son's playing it. He's a rec league baseball game in Smyrna, a rec league fall baseball game. He said, our team hasn't lost. Uh, it's the final game of the season. My son is on deck, and I think the bases are going to be loaded. Pray. And so... Um, we did, man. We just stopped. And Amy said, what are you doing? I said, I'm praying because so-and-so, he's about to get up, base is loaded. So, and so you say, well, that, that doesn't seem like the most spiritual thing. Well, for that little guy in that moment, that's a big deal, right? What I love is just, what I love is just in everything, just guys saying, hey, 
join me in this because he's praying. If you've ever had a, if you've had to have a son or a daughter who's about to get up with the bases loaded championship game, you prayed, didn't you? Whether you're a believer or not, you prayed. I guarantee you did. Wish my dad would have prayed more in those situations for me. I, but anyways, right? But I just love that because he said, I want to involve others. Get, get involved in that. And you might ask, what happened? We got hit by a pitch. I don't know if that was good or bad for our prayers. But anyways, he got on base. So some of you say, are you making that up? No, it's exactly what happened. Um, let me watch something else because in this you see Moses is praying and Joshua is doing what? Fighting. Here's the thing about prayer. Prayer doesn't ever eliminate the fight. It just paves the way for the victory. Does that make sense? A lot of times we'll say, I'll pray for you. We aren't going to do anything else, right? That's really a joke. I mean, Charles Spurgeon, in fact, uh, I listened to Pastor Greg's podcast on this, this, this same passage. He had this same quote. I, I, I want to know that I, I had it in there uh, before I listened to that. But anyways, listen to what Spurgeon said. You've got to think about this. I mean, Spurgeon's, it's, it's old English here. But he said, prayer is a downright mockery if it does not lead us into the practical use of means likely to promote the ends for which we pray. In other words, Sp- Spurgeon says, prayer is a joke if that's all you're willing to do, you're not willing to get in the fight. Say, I'll pray for you. Instead of meeting the need that a person has uh, in their life, just standing with them, encouraging them, providing for what, what, what they need. So it, it, it's, it's not, just, not just praying. It's also contending or fighting. Now, when Moses, look at verse 12. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and her held his hands up one on one side and one on the other so that his hands remained steady till sunset. That's pretty cool, isn't it? And again, these are 80 to 90-year-old dudes, right? One thing about an 80-year-old guy, he knows comfort. Moses, after a while, says, you don't have to give me something to sit on right here. Listen, here's the third thing tonight about leadership. Great leaders have a proper vantage point. Does that make sense? God's vantage point. Great leaders realize prayer is a matter of life and death. You know, who are you really contending for? What are you really contending for in prayer? You ever thought about that? I want to touch on that. I don't want to leave that. It's a matter of life and death, isn't it? Pray like it's a matter of life and death in the circumstance and situation. Number three, great leaders prioritize community. Now, let me just go ahead and tell you this because every time I talk about community, people just check out because we've been talking about community around here forever. I want to say some things about community tonight that I've never said before. Um, and, and if Joseph's here tonight, he probably won't like what I'm, I'm, about, I'm about to say. Listen, being in a small group here at the church is not the only place that you can have biblical community, right? I'm willing to admit that. I mean, it is a place, and you can find it there. It's a great place to start if you don't, if you don't have that, but you can have community. But what does community mean? Because it's a big churchy word that everybody loves to use, it, but what does it really mean? Well, in this story, I mean, Moses goes up from sun up to sundown. And he's got Aaron and her right there with him, and they're going to stand right there with him, and they hold his hands up all day. It sounds to me like here's some guys that loved Moses and that he loved him, them, right? Sounds like these guys had a deep abiding relationship. So having community to me in this passage means having someone to hold your hands when you're weary and discouraged. Who do you have that will hold your hands in those times that you're, you're, you're weary and discouraged? Having someone who will go to the top of the hill with you. Watch this because... Please listen to what I'm about to say. In the, in the South, like so many people in the South, well, listen, I don't really need community because my, my mom and dad are here, my brother and sister are here. I've got friends. Friends and community, that's not necessarily the same thing, right? It's not just having somebody who will bring a casserole over when you're, when you're sick. It's somebody who will go to the mountain with you and, you, and you say, what do you mean go to the mountain with you? Somebody who will help you have God's perspective in the midst of a situation, Right? You see that? Moses and Aaron went to the mountain, to that vantage point, because, listen, they, they, they were reminding Moses and, and giving them God's perspective. Who do you have in your life and the difficult moments in your life will be there to encourage you, but then will speak truth to you, will give you God's perspective in the midst of that. Do you understand the difference? Community is a little different from friendship. It's not just golfing buddies, right? right? You can, you can have community with your golfing buddies, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you will have community. Do they go to the mountain with you, right? And, and let me just say this. Please, don't make this merely about you. So, so many times we, we say, well, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't need this. Well, listen, you're missing the whole point. Well, somebody probably needs you. Somebody probably needs you. You need to be close enough to somebody. Somebody probably needs you that you can go to the mountain with, with them. Well, listen, here's another question that I have. Just People say, well, well, how do you find guys like that or gals like that? That's a great question to ask. How do you find Aaron or, or hers, right? How do you do that? Well, let me say this. you got to be that first. 
You got to be that for somebody. You know, you got, you got to be that kind of person that, that, that's willing to hold their hand up and, and sit with them, encourage them, contend with them, take them to the mountain. Uh, I, I love this. It's not enough to have deep commitment or deep convictions. We have so many folks in the church that have deep commitments and deep convictions. We believe maybe they're right, but you need deep connections found in community. That's really an important thing. You see, you got to have it. I love what Dietrich uh, Bonhoeffer, the great uh, Lutheran theologian and pastor, said in maybe one of the, 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 the greatest books of all time is The Cost of Discipleship that Bonhoeffer wrote. He says this. He said, sin demands to have a man by himself. It withdraws him from the community. The more isolated a person is, the more destructive will be the power of sin over him. Right? Can I tell you something? Community alters history. It certainly did in this story. You see it? It certainly did in this story. The community that Moses had around him. Now look at Exodus chapter 17, verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, now I know know it's time to go. The greatest theology, the greatest doctrine, the greatest truth, I think, in this passage, we're about to read it. And man, I know, like after listening to somebody like me, For 30 minutes, you're done. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Look at verse 14. The Lord said to Moses, this is after the Israelites are victorious over the Amalekites, write this on a scroll. First time God tells Moses to write anything down. Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered. When God says write it down for the first time, you might want to do that, right? And for us, we might ought to listen up. Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. I love that. Make sure that Joshua, what did Joshua just done? Joshua just led the children of Israel in their first victory, right? So he's feeling 10 foot tall and bulletproof. And God says, make sure Josh hears this, right? Because I will com- completely blot-, blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. That's not going to happen until King David does that. If you really want to get into the Bible, it's, it's why Saul lost his throne because he wouldn't deal with this, but that's for another day. Verse 15, here we go. You ready? Verse 15, Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. Jehovah Nissi. The Lord is my banner. He said, watch watch verse 16. Because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. This is an intentional comparison that God's doing. God says, hey, build an altar. and, And Moses builds an altar and you call it, The Lord is my banner. And then God says, I have done this because hands were lifted up. Who were the hands? The Amalekites. The way this is written in the Hebrew is so powerful. The way that's written in the Hebrew is that fists were raised towards God. And so do you know what God's saying? This is so powerful, man. God is saying, I want you to write this down because here's what I want everyone to remember, especially, especially Joshua, that you will either raise a banner to your God or you will raise a fist to your God. Right? We'll flesh that out. The Lord will be at war with the Amalekites from generation to generation. Now, can I just tell you something? Sin makes us do some stupid things, doesn't it? I mean, if my grandson was listening, he'd say, Pop, Pop, you can't say stupid. I'm sorry. Dumb. Makes you say dumb things. Makes you do dumb things. Think about the Amalekites for a second. The children of Israel, God had just led them to utterly destroy Egypt, part the Red Sea, and completely destroy the army of the Egyptians, the most powerful army in the world. And somewhere along the line, the Amalekites thought they could take them. They're like, hey, let's go get them. And then can you imagine a meeting? They're like, well, they just completely annihilated the Egyptians, right? Completely destroyed them. Most powerful army. We're not even close to them. And they destroyed them. I think we should take them. That's just dumb, isn't it? I mean, for the Amalekites, it's just, it's just dumb. It's what's, sin just leads us to do some really dumb things. Sin leads us to really raise our fist against God, which is a dumb thing. That's what the Amalekites did. Now, here it is. Look at this. Look at this tonight. We're almost done, but I want you to get this. Man, I want to know this deeply. Great leaders raise a banner, not a fist. On a daily basis, great leaders will raise a banner, not a fist. Now, watch this. Um, one of the good things about being in, in, in quarantine, it was during the, last week during the National League Championship Series, my Atlanta Braves. I love the Atlanta Braves. I love the Atlanta Braves all my life. You don't lo- like the Atlanta Braves, that's, that's cool, but whatever, I love them. They're up three games to one in the National League Championship Series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. I thought the Braves are going to win the pennant. 
That's what, when you win the National League or the American League, let me just give you a baseball education for just a second. You win a pennant. It's a flag that you will fly. Some of you are like, I don't care. What's well, biblical? You better care, right? You fly a flag in your stadium for the rest of time. It's a big deal. Nobody could take it away. It says we're victorious. We're the National League champs. We won the pennant. And if it wasn't for Mookie Betts from Nashville that robbed us of the pennant, we would have had a flag. It says vi- vi- victorious. So that's a picture of a flag. What is a flag being raised? It's being raised in victory, right? That's what when God says, you call this altar. The Lord is my banner. Jehovah's, Jehovah Nissi. It's a picture of, 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 of victory. It, it, it means, um, I, I remember it as an elementary kid. I don't know if you did this, but in, in our school, in my elementary school, there were two, when you got to be a sixth grader, there were like two great jobs you could get. Number one, you could be the crossing guard. You got to wear this killer vest. You remember the crossing guard vest back in the day? Some of you, it was an awesome vest. You like, it had like a, 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 a big like patch on it, like sheriff's like, uh, what am I looking at, uh, thinking about? Anyways, it was cool, cool vest. And then you could be on the flag duty. You got to raise the flag every morning. Any of you ever remember that? Man, you like to go out, you could raise the flag every morning. It was awesome. You walk back into your class, you were a boss, right? You're on flag patrol. You raised the, raise the flag. But you did it every single day. And like we raised the flag, we did the pledge to the flag. We're really saying, you know what, we're, we're a part of something greater. The United States of America, and we celebrated that, right? So it's like we come under its authority and under protection. Some of you, listen, I'm, I'm not getting political here. I'm just trying to connect the dots for you. Because here's what raising a banner means. Watch this. Here's what raising a banner means. And listen to what I'm about to say. You will either raise a banner in your life or you'll raise a fist. That's the only option you have. Does that make sense? I mean, that's what we see, and that's what God's saying. I mean, I want you to call this altar on the other side of this victory, Moses. I want you to call it Jehovah Nisa, the Lord is my banner. Or you're going to be like the Amalekites who just raised a fist, which is really dumb. Would you agree with that? Raising a fist toward God. Can we all just find some agreement if you're watching online? It's not smart, right? Not smart. But what does it mean to raise a banner? What does that really mean? It means I live under his authority. Like, can I say this to you tonight for me? Any area of my life that I'm not living under the authority of Jesus Christ, I am raising my fist to God. You see it? That's dangerous, isn't it? Like, that's really got my attention. So it means I live under his authority. Number two, I fight for his kingdom. That's why with this flag being raised and these soldiers behind us. They understand when a man or woman goes and takes the battlefield, they're fighting for this country. I, listen, is our country perfect? No. I just tell people who want to be critical of our country, travel a little bit around the world. You'll be glad to be back. No amens to that. But anyhow, neither here nor there. But really what they're saying is I fight for this kingdom, but that's what Jehovah Nisi means, that I fight for his kingdom. In any area of my life where I'm fighting for my kingdom instead of fighting for his kingdom, I'm raising a fist to my God. That's what it means to raise a banner on a daily basis. Jesus, I want to live under your authority. I want to fight for your kingdom. And then the third thing is I want to praise you for your victories. That's what he wanted Joshua to hear. Because it wasn't about what Joshua did. It's about what God did. Hey, let's make sure Joshua gets this. I don't want to give it the big head. It was God who brought the victory. And so... Listen, there are times in my life where I want to take credit for something that God's done, a victory that God's won in my life. Anytime I take credit for a victory that God's done in my life, I'm not raising a banner. I'm doing what? Help me. Raising a fist. There's only two things we can do. You're going to raise a fist or you're going to raise a banner. Which one's it going to be? Look down at Exodus chapter 18. I know this the music is telling me it's time to go. I know. I love it. Exodus 18. Exodus 18 is so funny to me. Uh, chapter 18. All of a sudden, go back and read it. Will you read it tonight before you go to bed? Uh, nobody answered that. It was super good. One, that's all I need. One, Exodus 18, right after the victory, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, rolls into town. And he's bringing Moses' wife and his two boys. He's like a granddad. like, hey, Moses, here's your kids. I'm done. And your wife. And, and, and there's something here, I, I think. We had some, some more time. I mean, it's time. I mean, Moses had left his wife and his kids to go and do what he did back in, in Egypt. And, and I don't know, somewhere along the line, he, he thought it would probably be better to do this without them. And God's trying to show you, if you want to be a great leader, listen, your professional life can't, can't outpace your personal life. Get mom and them boys back home. 
right? I tell young guys in, in, in ministry, if your ministry is outpacing your marriage, you're going to lose both of them, right? That was just free. But Jethro rolls in. Moses gets his wife and his boys back. And then the next morning, Moses is out doing what Moses does. All the people are coming to him. Moses is the judge. Moses got the seat. Everybody's coming and bringing their complaints. I mean, Moses, I mean, Moses is the guy, right? Are you with me? I mean, Moses is the dude. Moses is the guy who liberates the children of Israel from Egypt. Moses is the guy who raises his staff in the Red Sea part. Can you agree with me? Moses is the dude. He's got it going, right? 80-year-old guy, his father-in-law. Moses is at work. And his father-in-law rolls out, drinking a cup of coffee, walking around, seeing what Moses is doing. Can you imagine that? Your father-in-law shows up at your workplace when you got, I mean, when you, when you got it going. Here's Jethro. He's not, even, he's not even a believer at this point. When he rolls in, I believe, my, 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 my belief, Moses tells him about the great things that God does, and, and Jethro says, there are no other gods like your God. He was a priest, but he was a priest of many gods. And he says, there's no other God like your God, and then he offers a sacrifice and has a meal. So for, for my understanding of Exodus chapter 18, Jethro becomes a follower of the living God. And then the next morning, he's out there. Moses is at work. Look at verse 17. I love this. Moses' father-in-law replied. He walks up to Moses on the job. It says, what you're doing is not good. How would that go over with you, right? Like your your father-in-law shows up at your workplace and like, I want to tell you something. You're not doing that right. Some of you are like, that is my father-in-law with everything in my life, right? But especially if you were Moses, man. I mean, think about all the victories that Moses had won. He's, and he's like, you just have been a Christian for a day, Jethro, right? What, what are you doing? What you're doing is not good. You and all these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. I mean, Jethro says it's like a bad DMV line. I mean, you got people waiting forever. You're trying to see all these cases. The work is too heavy for you. You not you cannot handle it. So Jethro teaches him a lesson in delegation. Right? Now that that here's the point. Here's the point I want to make, and I'm done. Great leaders have a proper vantage point. Would you agree with that? You've got to see it correctly. Great leaders realize prayer is a matter of life and death. Great leaders prioritize community. You got to have some people. You got to have some Aaron and hers who will go to the hill with you, right? And great leaders, they raise a banner, not a flag, every, uh, not not a fist every day. Great leaders raise a banner, not a fist. Do you agree with that? Yeah. And then lastly, great leaders are teachable. Moses is teachable. I mean, here's a guy. Here's his father-in-law. After God just used him to bring the children of Israel out of captivity, and what Jethro says to Moses is right. He's right. He's teachable. Listen. If you think you're indispensable, you're delusional. Right? That went over well. I mean, and that's, that, that's, what, that's what Jethro's saying. He's saying, hey, if you think you're indispensable, Moses, you're crazy. You're going you're to kill yourself, and the people are going to hate it. Right? You see, having a teachable spirit, we need it. Having a teachable spirit, listen, it greets our blindness with sight. Let me tell you something tonight. Let me tell you something, and I'll be done. You're wrong about something right now in your life. Moses was. You think you're sharper than him? Well, I'll just talk, I'll just speak to, speak to myself. I think I'm sharper than Moses. The answer is no. Moses was wrong about something. And there's a chance tonight for you and me that we're we're wrong about something. There's some area, large or small, some facet of our life that we're so we we just don't see correctly. Would you? And I can just look. I just look at the. I, I read you as you read me. You didn't like that, did you? Nobody likes being told that. Can you imagine your father-in-law coming out and telling you that? Right? Proverbs 16, 25, there's a way that seems, appears to be right, but in the end leads to death. If you're going to be a great leader, you've got to be teachable. First of all, God, show me something that I am just believing that's not true. You've got to have some friends. And listen, the truth of the matter is, I want to say this. The truth of the matter is there's probably some people in your life who have been trying to say this to you for a long time, but you won't listen, right? You won't listen. I find that to be true in counseling. I've seen that true forever. Whenever you reveal something to somebody and you'll hear a wife, usually a wife, say, I've been telling him that for years. One of the things I love about Moses, and it's, it's, a part, it, it's so easy to miss it, he's just teachable. He's just teachable. He says, you know what? Yeah, God used me to set the Israelites free, part the Red Sea. I tapped on a rock yesterday and water came out. Cool. But I'm wrong about some things. I need to be teachable. I want that spirit in my own life. 
Lord, show me the things that I'm not seeing correctly. Would you, do you want that? Jesus, show me the things that I'm not seeing correctly. Hey, I, I tried to highlight something in the Scripture. I, I was reading it maybe a little, little with, you know, enunciating it a little bit more. I want to close with this. Let me ask you this. When you see Moses and Aaron and her up on that hillside, does it remind you of anything? When you see Moses and you see two guys beside him up on that hillside, does it remind you of anything? It's kind of a shadow of the cross, isn't it? And you see Joshua, Yeshua, the same name as our Savior who's out on the battlefield and he wins a battle. Does it remind you of anything? Yeah, it does. It is such a shadow of the gospel, isn't it? such foreshadowing of the victory that can be ours. And can I ask you a question? In your life, are you going to raise a banner or are you going to keep raising a fist? I, I'm, I'm talking to a specific group tonight. Maybe it's just somebody watching online. Maybe somebody here. Give me 30 seconds. Some of you, all of your life, you've been raising a fist to God. But tonight, raising a banner means this, accepting the victory that he's already won. That can be yours, raising that banner. You see, what does it mean? Not only accepting the victory that he's won, it means coming under his authority. Is there an area right now in your life that you're just raising a fist to God, you're outside of his authority? Are you fighting more for your kingdom or his, raising a banner or raising a fist? Would the Lord reveal that to you tonight? And for somebody in this place... Can I tell you the victory that he's already won? The victory that he's already won is the greatest victory in the world. The Lord Jesus has defeated sin and he's defeated death. Do you believe that? Let me ask you again. I'll let you go. Do you believe that Jesus has defeated sin? He lived a sinless life. He defeated death. He rose from the grave. And that victory that he won can be your victory. He can be your Jehovah Nissi, that banner. The banner says victory. Like, you can raise that banner. How do you raise that banner? By faith, by trusting in Christ alone, by seeing it, right? Seeing those three guys on the hillside, it is a reminder of what would happen 1,400 years later when the ultimate Yeshua would climb the hillside to die to set us free so that we could raise a banner. Can I pray for you tonight? I just wonder if there's one person here tonight. I just wonder if there's one person here that would say, you know what, to be honest, all of my life I've raised a fist. I'm ready to raise a banner. I wonder if there are multiple believers tonight that would say, in an area of my life I've not come under the authority of the Lord and I'm raising a fist in this area of my life and I just realize it's just dumb. I just wonder if there are other believers here tonight that would say, you know what, God, give me a teachable spirit. Moses, there was something that Moses was doing in his life that was wrong, he didn't see. That's true of me. Reveal to me blindness in my life. Reveal some area of my life that I just don't see. Father, thank you for this moment and time. Thank you for your grace and thank you for your mercy. And Lord, I pray tonight that maybe there's someone that would put that faith and trust in Christ, the victory that Jesus has already won, and raise a banner. You would be that banner over them, a banner of victory. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Maybe tonight you feel something stirring with inside of you. I want to encourage you not to leave tonight until you've done work with God, until you've had an opportunity to find out what it means to accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. We have an opportunity, of course, for you to text NEXT to the number on the screen. You can also call this number starting tomorrow morning as early as 6 a.m. I'll be answering the phone. Feel free to call me. Give it a try. Let's chat 6 a.m. tomorrow. Also, I'd love a chance just to chat with you down at the Next Steps room. Maybe you have questions about baptism or salvation. We want to meet you where you're at. Hope you guys have an incredible rest of your week. God bless you. I'm going to dismiss this in sections. We'll start with the far section over here to my right, your left. You guys are dismissed.